my analysis is that he didn't just limit Marxism to violent revolution, physical revolution. He moved Marxism to a more ideological revolution. It's not by picking up your torches, your guns, your bricks. The way that we're going to revolutionize society, enliven this revolutionary consciousness, is by developing a consciousness and then promoting that consciousness through ideological means, through textbooks, through essays, through social media. What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of Logos Podcast. This is Max. This is Deacon Joey. I hope that y'all don't like that title as much as I don't like that title. <laughs> but as I've told Joey time and time again, I'm here to respect the wishes of the church and the bishop, and therefore I call you Deacon Joey. But if it were up to me, and if they were to have actually consulted the people of God like they said that they did in the right of ordination, in the right of ordination there would have been a, a negative for me. What title would you give me if it were up to you? Actually, don't answer that question. Yeah, don't okay. I don't it. think it's appropriate for our probably not, probably platform. Not. Speaking on behalf of the church here. We <laughs> yeah, I know. we got to be careful how we do it. Especially you, because you're an official. I will gladly call you Deacon Max when the time comes. Really. Wow. Thank you, Joey. Deacon Joey. <laughs> I appreciate I'll generosity. never call you Father Max, though. <laughs> <laughs> equals. Straight equals over we priest. What day? How are you doing, dude? Doing good, man. Uh, How to, I got to be honest with you, I slept in a little bit today. Nice. And it was nice. And uh, I felt a little unprepared, honestly, as I was like gathering myself for this morning. Mm. But here we are. It's early. We're recording this early. Yeah, typically we're recording the afternoons, but today is a a little early. We don't have class today. We don't have class today. Which is kind of nice. Cheers to. Cheers to all of the stuff and the reasons why we're not having class today, you know, which is. The solemnity of St. Joseph. Boom, let's go, baby. You know, Come on. We're celebrating the great saint. Yes. Um, and so today we have off. Yeah, we get all solemnities off at our seminary, which is nice. We get the Immaculate Conception off. That's right. Feast of St. Solemnity of St. Joseph off. Because the Christian church articulated the calendar, and we don't just go by the secular calendar. That's why. That's we right. respect the saints, not just That's whatever right. other Pride Month we're celebrating. So shout out to St. Joseph. I don't know. By the time we release this, it'll probably be maybe the week after St. Joseph's Day. That's right. Happy St. Joseph's Day to everyone, though. St. Joseph is my uh, patron. I don't know if I was, I was actually named after St. Joseph specifically. I don't think I was. But indirectly, I was, because the reason the, the name Joseph is a part of our Western tradition is because of St. Joseph. So the fact that that was even a name that my parents were considering. Or in Italian, Giuseppe. Giuseppe. Or Jose in Espanol. Claro que sí, ya tú sabes. Ya tú sabes. <laughs> cool, man. Um, so Solemnity of St. Joseph, going to be good. We're going to have a nice, beautiful mass and, and celebration today, even yeah. though it's Lent. Because that's awesome. Because that's so, how the church parties, what man. we do. Um, I think this is going to be a really good episode that we're about to get into. Yeah, and I think it's going to be a strong episode. What are we talking about today? Uh, today we're going to be talking about the writer and philosopher and thinker, Herbert Marcuse, or Herbert Marcuse. And I'm sure there's like a German pronunciation that I'm not aware of because he's a German philosopher. I so. want to say it like just an American and say Herbert Marcuse. But I know Herbert Marcuse coming <laughs> up in here today. We're talking about dead right here yonder. I uh, know that's... Well, we, we've been planning this episode for a long time. Yeah. Um, we were going to do it a little while ago, but then we wanted to... Prepare a little bit more for it because we think it's important. It's important, and he's a major thinker, and so we didn't want to take his, we didn't want to straw man his yeah. philosophy, and and quite frankly, we needed to learn some of it. To yeah, and so to, to be fair, before we get started, we are going to be painting in relatively broad strokes. We're just going to try to cover some of the main aspects yeah. of this guy's thought, but why are we talking about him? The reason we're talking about him, like the reason we talk about all the philosophers we choose to talk about, Friedrich Nietzsche. We talked about Michel Foucault. We talked about Karl Marx. Mm-hmm. You know, we we periodically do these episodes on philosophers because these men, they're well, ideas have consequences, right? And these guys, um, the way that they wrote, the way that they thought, has influenced the society in which we live. And we think that this guy has had largely a lot of negative influences on society. Yeah. And we want to. So a lot of the kind of chaos that we see in the world today. As Christians, as human beings, it can be very unsettling to live in a culture that's so chaotic, that's so disintegrated, that's so divided. And one of the things that helps us kind of get our feet underneath us is understanding where some of these ideas, some of these trends came from, right? So we think that some of the things that we're seeing in our world today can be traced back to the thought of this guy, Herbert Marcuse. Yeah. Um, so that's why we're going to kind of talk about him. 
And I know you had, had initially proposed this. How, where did you, I had never actually heard of this guy and then you encountered him. So talk about that. Where'd you, where'd you find him? So I ran across a name in a book that I read by Christopher Rufo. Um, and I can't remember the, the exact title is escaping my name, but he was on Bishop Barron. Bishop Barron interviewed him. Yeah. Right? He inter- interviewed him on word on fire and talked about, I think it's like, uh, is it like the American Cultural Revolution? That's right. Is how that the new called? left is dominating everything, or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, but anyways, that book and that book that the first, really throughout the entirety of the book, this name pops up. Mm-hmm. But certainly, the first four or five chapters are um, deeply influenced by the thought of Marcuse mm-hmm. and how he has influenced a lot of Marxist ideology mm-hmm. that uh, I think closely relates to the to the radical left to the new left. Um, but also, interestingly enough, how it relates to the American radical left. Yeah, the context here in America specifically. Right. And so I was, I kept reading this name, and uh, one of our buddies uh, mentioned talking about Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci, yep. the communist yep. thinker from Italy. And so that's kind of how it first started. Like he proposed this. Right, right. I was reading this book. I proposed it to Joey, and Joey's like, yeah, let's, let's talk about this. And, and another reason that I wanted to talk about this specific thinker is because he had a major influence on um, the American university system right. after um, the hippie and sexual revolution of the 60s, 70s, mm-hmm. um, and still on to today, arguably. Yeah. So, so we'll, and we'll talk about that, the effects yeah. of his thought that we're seeing in our university system right now. So I think it's a big deal. I think it's a big deal. Um, like we said, we're going to be painting in relatively broad strokes, just trying to capture some of the main themes of Marcuse's thought. Um, he is a member of the Frankfurt School of yeah. Thought, right? Should we talk a little bit about that before we get into kind of his biography? Um, the Frankfurt School began in Frankfurt. Yes, um, Germany. Yeah, deeply influenced by guys like Karl Marx. Karl Marx. Sigmund Freud, yes. right? Um, Hegel. Mm-hmm. So Marcuse was a member of this school, and the Frankfurt School came up with what we'll talk about here in a little bit, but what's come to be known as critical theory, Mm -hmm. right? Um, So we'll get into that, but I guess, should we talk a little bit about his biography? Yeah, let's do Um, that. So who is this guy before we start talking about his thoughts? So he was born in 1898, and he ended his career actually as a university professor um, in the United States. So born in Germany. Correct. Was Jewish, right, Mm -hmm. by ethnicity, and had to end up fleeing Germany during the Nazi persecutions. yeah. Um, some of his some of his professors, uh, one of them famously is uh, Martin Heidegger. Heidegger, yeah, right, which was officially associated with the Nazi regime, mm-hmm. and uh, Marcuse didn't feel that he could collaborate with him any further after that, and probably felt his life threatened to a certain extent, and so he fled Germany and came to the U.S. Yeah, and so um, with some other stops in between, but he, yeah, he finished yeah. his career here in the U.S. Uh, finished his life here in the U.S. and ended up teaching. I think his last major position was at the University of San Diego in California. Yeah, um, which is how he ended up having a big impact on the American cultural context. Mm. Didn't he also come to America and work in our governmental department? He did. He worked for like our Department of Defense or something like that. Yeah. Um, he himself, and maybe you know, he himself had served in the military when That's he was right. young, when he was a young man That's in right. his twenties. That's when he encountered actually. Marxist ideas for the first time. He was very interested in art and aesthetics and yeah. the impact that art and uh, really media could have on culture. Yeah. And so got influenced by Marx, started started imbibing some of these ideals. And then after he fled, made his way over here into the university system ultimately and started having a huge impact. He ended up becoming really a champion of a lot of these radical student movements in the 1960s these people were reading Marcuse uh, and using his ideas to fuel their kind of revolutionary spirit right I think I read in one of the books you shared with me that people were carrying around banners that would have like Marx Mao and Marcuse that's right those three names so Karl Marx Mao the communist dictator in China and then Marcuse, like he was in that school and people who were really influenced by communist ideals, they were championing, championing, what am I? Championing. Championing him. There we go. Um, And really holding him up as a a model and as a, somebody who was very influential. And another person that was deeply influenced by him was 
um, Angela Davis, who was one of the founding members of the Black Panther Party. Oh, uh, yeah, that's and right. I, and I think that's important because there's some personal correspondence between the two. Wow. Um, and so, but again, so, so here we have a, a German thinker who helped, was one of the founding members of the Frankfurt School um, and was deeply uh, embedded with critical theory. Yeah. And there are some of his works that we want to talk about that mm-hmm. help bring out his thought and uh, the way he proposed that society could be purified in a certain way. Before we get into Marcuse's thought proper, we wanted to give a little brief refresher on Marxism, right? Because he's, he's operating from a Marxist framework. And we've already done an episode on Karl Marx that you can go back and listen to. And it's funny, we've, we've actually received criticisms uh, from that episode. We were trying to give a very, very balanced intellectual approach to M- Karl Marx's thought, be very fair to the the real problems that he accurately identified and then also show what was problematic with his thought. People have told us you guys were not hard enough on Karl Marx. Like, so we do want to be clear. We are in no way um, sympathetic to Marxist ideology. We think it's evil. We think it's the source of incredible suffering and violence in the world. And so what we wanted to do is just give a brief refresher on some of the basic tenets of Marxism and then talk about why they're evil <laughs> yeah and the why reason really and the reason bad. we do we do this the way that we do is because we want to get to the root of the ideas right right our, right our our motive here is not to in any way align ourselves to any sort of political alliance it's more so to expose the ideas that's undergirding the thought process and, and I think that's that's what our mission initially was and is to help bring you all hopefully to closer to the truth of the situation. Yeah, and when you're Lord. this is just a general thing that I is, I think is so important. When you're dealing with a set of ideas that you that you disagree with, that you're not sympathetic to, it is important to try to figure out why the other people find those ideas attractive, right? Like there is like nobody would have become a Marxist if there wasn't something some element of truth in what sure. he was saying, right? But really the whole system taken as a whole becomes diabolical. That's what the devil likes to do. He likes to feed us little truths to try to get us entrapped into what end up being lies. Mm -hmm. And uh, this this is what happens with Marxism. But, okay, so briefly, the tenets of Marxism. So so Karl Marx was, he was a materialist, right? A historical Uh, materialist. A historical materialist. And what this means is that he denied, first of all, any, he was a materialist, so he denied any existence of the transcendence of the spiritual world of God. He was very militantly atheistic. He thought that matter ultimately is the only thing that exists, no spirit. And he thought that really history itself was kind of a God that, that moved and transformed according to certain patterns and carried itself out. And he said, and, and really the fundamental structures of this historical development of this material world that we lived in operated according to the logic of class struggle Mm -hmm. for him. Right. So for Marx, he saw that there was inevitable class struggle that was that had always been underway yeah. between the oppressed and the oppressors, yeah. which he saw being manifested in the 19th century context in which he was writing between the capitalists, the bourgeois, and the proletariat, the working class. Yeah, so you keep in mind historical context here. It was uh, kind of at the uprise of the Industrial Revolution. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So he saw kind of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer, and he saw, as Jay was saying, an inevitable um, clash between... Uh, the feudalist and the bourgeois or the proletariats mm-hmm. and the bourgeoisie, right? The upper class and the lower class. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, his, he saw things that were problematic with capitalism in its, in its original form, right? Before there were any kind of regulations when it was just pure, unadulterated capitalism, just kind of in full force at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So he saw men being reduced to kind of slaves, you know, mm-hmm. to the system. They were alienated from their labor. They were forced into factories, child labor was taking place they were being abused women and children were being forced into these factories he saw that men were no longer being treated as persons but they were being reduced to mere cogs in the great economic machine right that's a famous quote from marx and he did he saw that the owners of production the owners of all the capital the guys who own the factories and and everything that needed uh that was needed to produce they were getting richer and richer and smaller and smaller in number Mm -hmm. power was being concentrated and the proletariat the working class as max just mentioned was getting larger and poorer so what marx predicted because he was a materialist and he saw what he identified what he thought were these inevitable and deterministic historical laws 
he said that inevitably what's going to happen is there's going to end up being a revolution. The proletariat are going to rise up. They're going mm-hmm. to, their class consciousness is going to be awakened. They're going to realize that they're being oppressed by these bourgeois owners of the means of production. And they're going to overthrow. Well, first they're going to seize the means of production. They're going to seize the means of production. Right. That's so, right. so how does the lower class gain power and domination again? Well, they seize the means of production, right? Because for him, it was the producer and it was, um, and it was those doing the producing, right? And so there was, again, it, it's, the same, it's the same bifurcation of classes, right? On the one hand, you have the upper class and on the other hand, you have the lower class and there's this play between them. And yeah. the lower class saw that the means that we revolutionize things is by actually gaining the power over the production lines. Right? That's right. So Marx predicted, and again, for him, this was inevitable because history was deterministic. It was only material. The conditions were falling into place. He was reading what he thought were the signs of the times and said, this is inevitably going to happen. The proletariat are going to rise up and rebel against the bourgeoisie. They're going to seize the means of production. They're going to take control for a while. And then ultimately, after all this takes place, what's going to happen is everyone is going to be happy and they're going to settle. We're going to settle into this classless society, right? There's just like, there's this idea that he says, like, we're going to fish in the morning, hunt in the afternoon and read a book at night where everyone's going to be free to do what they want when they want. So he's, I, he's envisioning this kind of utopian ideal in which everyone is perfectly happy and everyone owns everything together. Exactly. That's important, right? So everybody's equal. There's a classless society. Nobody has an upper footing on anybody else. Everything is equalized. Um, now here's the real problem with Marx. So all of that stuff, we would, we would dispute his materialistic worldview. We would dispute the historical materialism. We would dispute, um, his complete disregard of capitalism and industrial revolution. Right. right. We think that those things absolutely have some value, even though there were, uh, abuses of them in their early stages, private property, the church, you know, defends the the right to private property, but also the dignity of the individual this and the worker. Where, this right? is where it gets. Yeah. And also the dignity. So Correct. Marx was right to see that p- workers were being mistreated, mistreated. Yeah. But here's where Marx really goes astray for him. The revolution is inevitable and it's necessary for the sake of the common good. And so the revolution should be encouraged, mm-hmm. should be fostered. And even if the revolution involves violence and killing, yep. uh, the, the, the famous quote from Vladimir Lenin, you have to crack a few eggs to make an omelet. Yeah. So for the sake of the common good, as Marx understood it, it's okay if the proletariat end up, you know, killing a few people or destroying some things because it's for the greater good. And this is ultimately the evil of Marxism. It promises a worldly salvation, a worldly utopia, and it subjugates the dignity of the individual to that hypothesized worldly utopia. And then people can be discarded for the sake of that greater good. Correct. That's brought Marxism in broad strokes. And I think it's a very good job. And one figure that we felt to mention that I think is important in Marx, yeah. deeply influential on Marx and deeply influential then on Herbert Marcuse. Marcuse, Marcuse yeah. Marcuse is Hegel. Yeah, Hegel. Right. Um, and, it, and I think just very briefly, it touches on kind of the foundation of Karl Marx. He is a historical materialist. Mm-hmm. Historical in the sense that, as Joey was saying, history is kind of the unfolding of God. Yeah. Hegel, Hegel thought that he observed, you know, like Marx, he thought that he observed these patterns within history. There's a thesis and then there's an antithesis that comes, an opposing worldview or ideologically or si- ideology or system. Those things inevitably clash and result in a newer and higher form of society, a synthesis of some kind, right? Hegel thought that, Hegel thought that there was some sort of spiritual activity involved in this, that there was kind of a God figure, even though he wasn't transcended, he was kind of imminent to history. But Marx said, no, there's no God, but this kind of fundamental pattern does exist, right? And so now the thesis is there's capitalism. The antithesis is going to be um, there's going to be communism. And then the synthesis is going to be this classless society that we eventually get to. And this train of thought, this historical materialism, this God, this consciousness carries forth into the Marxist school in America, really, in Germany, but also in America, of which Herbert Marcuse was a major prominent figure of. Right, so that's important. So we can transition now to. There goes my water bottle. What's going on? I just I just dropped my water bottle. That's all good. I feel like everything is falling. Listeners can um, vote on whether or not they think this water bottle is girly or not, and then let my sisters know because they got it for me as a Christmas gift or birthday gift. Actually, I've come to embrace it. As a real man does. As a real man does. He receives what he's given. 
Anyway, Herbert Marcuse, he he's operating in a new context, right? So this Frankfurt school, what they realized was, okay, Marx was kind of wrong. Not in his fundamental principles, but in his predictions, right? right. So by the time we're into the 19... 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, these guys are seeing, okay, all these attempted communist revolutions have failed yeah. in Europe, in Russia. Um, all of the proletariat has not successfully risen up and overcome the bourgeois class, right? And so what do we do now? There was kind of this crisis of Marxism and the Frankfurt School was you know, deeply influenced by Marx and trying to save these, this Marxist ideology. And what they ended up doing was appropriating it to a new context, a new cultural context. So now Herbert Marcuse, he says, OK, yes, these these revolution, this revolution does need to take place, but it is not only going to be a revolution of the proletariat. Mm. The revolutionary consciousness of the people needs to be needs to be coming from many different uh, elements of society and not just the unsophisticated uneducated that's right their whole idea was to make a kind of sophisticated systematic approach to marxism a more elaborate yeah idea, with right? academics with intelligence yeah. and they started calling their members the members of the frankfurt school not just the founders but also those who affiliated themselves with the school to put on a suit put on the tie and change institutions from within yeah, so this kind of became the goal. And Marcuse, yeah. he, he, he wanted to cultivate this revolutionary spirit, not just within the proletariat, the working class, but also anywhere that he saw any spark of what could be a revolutionary spirit, he tried to enkindle it. So mm-hmm. in the feminist movements in America, in the sexual revolution. The pacifists. The pacifist movement. Yeah, the, yeah, the, anti, the anti-Vietnam War, all that yeah. stuff. The Black Panther movement, right? Like Correct. anywhere that he could see what he wanted to do was cultivate this revolutionary spirit and subjectivity in the American people to bring about in a way that Marx could not have predicted, but that he ultimately, um, you know, was right in predicting the basic structure of ultimately bring about this revolution, an overthrow of the systems of oppression. Yeah, I mean, the whole idea here, again, of developing the consciousness of a people so as to take on the revolutionary spirit. And here comes a critical theory, right? The critical theory is um, an emphasis here on recognizing the oppressive systems, recognizing the structures of sin within society, criticizing them, um, and revolutionizing them. That's kind of the that's kind of the hermeneutic, if you will. It's the way that you read and understand reality. It's by criticizing the structures of oppression, of injustice, revolutionizing them, and keeping that perpetual cycle going. And hopefully, by this point in the conversations, our listeners are are starting to kind of see, like, okay, I'm seeing this type of spirit all around me. Criticize, revolutionize, try to uh, overcome some oppressor that might not even appear to be there at first, but that I'm gonna say is there Mm -hmm. just so that I can overcome him. Like we see this all around us today and we'll get into that more. But, um, should we talk about the one dimensional man? Yes, I think we should. So the one dimensional man is a major work, probably one of arguably one of the most influential works of, uh, Marcuse. And in this book, he calls it the one dimensional man because he's recognizing a problem within society. Capitalist, specifically American society, right? That he's seeing. So he's making an assessment of the contemporary culture. And in the book, he also provides some sort of an ideal of which man is called to be, right? So he provides a kind of framework of understanding who man is. So he provides a sort of anthropology. This is kind of the book. And he's criticizing a capitalist society. Calls it one-dimensional. He calls it one-dimensional, right? Um, What does that mean? Simply put, it means that man has become comfortable. He's become comfortable as a slave to the system. Yep. Because... Technology has tempered our revolutionary spirit. Yeah, um, it has stopped our conscience, our minds from criticizing those systems which are oppressing us. And so he's become one-dimensional because he's been comfortable. He's become comfortable, right? He has. He talks about man has been condemned to the hell of an affluent society. That's right, right. Uh, and I know the Frankfurt School was deeply critical of technology generally mm-hmm. because, in their view, man was kind of. Com- condensed to the reality of a square which by a square they were talking about a tv or a screen yeah right? so all of a sudden technology became the way that we understood reality but in their head we became on marcuse's mind we became one-dimensional because we became slaves to what the 
technology was telling us, what the society was telling us. And we, we attached our, our identities to what? The, the American people. Mm-hmm. We attached our identities to the sport that was being broadcasted instead of actually being critical of the systems that were, again, in their head simultaneously oppressing us. Yeah, so it's the technology that's kind of oppressing us and pacifying us without us even really realizing it. And all the while, we think we're free. We think that we live in this free country and that we, we have all these freedoms that we're enjoying, but really we're slaves to the, the capitalists, the corporations. The bourgeois. Are, the bourgeois class that's still here, that's still oppressing us, but what they've done is they've tricked us into being happy with our oppression, right? Because we have cool gadgets and toys. Um, now, it's interesting. He says, how, you know, he asked the question, how did, how did this happen? How did we get mm-hmm. to this one-dimensional society? And one of the things that he says, following upon some of the other members of the Frankfurt School, is, well, part of what brought us here is the Enlightenment, mm-hmm. right? So the Enlightenment, which put all this focus on reason, on the development of technology, Science. Science. It was great. Like, it got us all these cool things. And it's been greatly beneficial for society in some senses. It's been yeah. very beneficial. But what it's actually done is it's it's provided the conditions for the ruling class to oppress us and to pacify us and to keep us content in our position of slavery. Yes. Yeah, so, the, so there's a kind of a, an ironic promotion of enlightenment in his mind. Cause it, because in the one sense, they're arguing for freeing man to the power of his reason. And the power of creativity. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, they're also simultaneously providing a new way to oppress man. Right? So instead of reason becoming a liberating means for man, it becomes a dominating means for man. Instead of technology being a liberating means for man, it becomes a way in which man is perpetually oppressed. Yeah, so we've got this we've got this one dimensional society. And it's you know, I read Marcuse Marcuse on this and I like this is where I do see like he he was tapped into something true about our culture right like to a large extent we are slaves to our technology i know i am we are pacified by the the you know amazon rules us because we can just get whatever we want whenever we want and we're kind of happy with that and the market forces not only respond to but even begin to shape our desires right like advertising makes us want things that we don't even actually need but then we feel like we're in a position of scarcity if we don't have these things right so so I think he, and this is why I think he was attractive, Yeah. right? Because people were noticing this and thinking like, this guy has a point, Yeah. you know? Um, and so, 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 so this, this, again, this, this one dimensional man is influenced by the enlightenment, yep. right? So the whole idea is that the one dimensional man has become this because partly in due because of the historical movement of the enlightenment. Of the enlightenment. Right. And, you know, what are some of the other things that he says got us to this point as a, to become a one dimensional society full of one dimensional men? Well, he says just a a couple of things. He says the systems that we have make citizens believe that they are more free than they are. Mm -hmm. He says that the systems provide citizens with enough goods to keep them tempered. He says people feel unified he says, because they watch the same TV shows, right? Yeah. Like you said, Max, or they cheer for the same sports teams. But really, there's no true unity. There's no true culture. If I wear the jersey and that guy wears a jersey, we must be of the same We're cloth, brothers. baby. Yeah, that's right. We're the same race. We're the same people. We're the same ideas. Same tribe. Same tribe. Yeah. And then finally, he says, political discourse is eliminated. Which is very interesting, right? So interesting. And, and and I would argue political, and I would add to that, religious. Yes. You know, discourse is eliminated. Yeah, so he sa- he thinks this is part of the mechanism by which the ruling class has enslaved society. It's by slowly and gradually eliminating political discourse, very intentionally, he thinks. And instead of talking about substantive ideas, moving to, you know, kind of these pious platitudes, like you mentioned, the American people or the American way of life. Or, and sorry to bring this in, but make America great again. Make America great again, right? right? It's this idea that by commercializing a type of people, a race of people, a group of identities, uh, an encapsulating of ideological motivation, we can unify our people. We can channel that energy to one limited ideal. Yeah. Right? Whereas here, Marcuse is saying, no, we need to unshackle ourselves from this bourgeois movement of trying to temper this revolutionary this critical spirit within us yeah he said we're being repressed right so this is a very freudian move of him he was influenced by sigmund freud and he thought that there were kind of these two forms of repression that were present in society the first was fine and good and even necessary basic repression he called it so it was like 
okay, everyone needs to, to a certain extent, repress their own revolutionary individualistic instincts in order to live comfortably in society with others. He granted that. But he said there's this thing that's going on right now called surplus repression. And basically what that is, it's exactly this, what we've described. The ruling class, these capitalists or whatever it is, the systems, you know, they are forcing everyone, tricking really everyone into repressing themselves so much so that we're happy and content being slaves. And so what Marcu Marcuse ultimately wants is not a one-dimensional society he, or full of one-dimensional people. What he wants is a two-dimensional society full of two-dimensional men. For Marcuse, Max, what does it mean to be a two-dimensional man? As I stated earlier, briefly, um, it's important to keep in mind that he's influenced by, as we've mentioned time and time again, he's influenced by Marx, right? So you'll see in his ideal man, this two-dimensional man, the Marxist ideal come into play. Yep. And he sees the two-dimensional man this way. It's a man who practices critical thinking mm -hmm. or negative thinking, right? He criticizes the systems which... He finds himself in the systems that the oppressors have installed in society so as to keep him tempered. But not only does he criticize, does he think negatively of those structures and systems, he also seeks to revolutionize those very systems. So he's two-dimensional in that he's not comfortable by what's being fed to him. Yeah. But he's two-dimensional in that he critically thinks, he denounces, and then he revolutionizes. This is what he wants. This is what it means to be two-dimensional. Someone who is constantly trying to undermine and deconstruct the systems of oppression that are in place so as to revolutionize them and create a new reality, right? And, and I think this is very interesting. Yeah. Partly because he took Marx, Marxism a step further. How so? It's my analysis, again, this is my analysis that he didn't just limit... Marxism to kind of violent revolution, physical revolution. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. He moved Marxism to a more ideological revolution. An intellectual revolution. An intellectual, yeah. a, a sophisticated revolution. It's how do you change a people? It's not by picking up your torches, your guns, your bricks. Although he was fine with that if that happened, exactly. by the way. And he, he call, and he called people to that yeah. on various occasions. But... Later in his writings, you see a development in Marcuse saying, no, actually, the way that we're going to revolutionize society and enliven, enliven this revolutionary consciousness is by developing a consciousness and then promoting that consciousness through ideological means, through textbooks, through essays, through social media, mm -hmm. right? And so he started using the same system that he was criticizing for his own means and the Marxist means at a larger venue. It's very sophisticated. It's very, um, and again, hopefully at this point, like people are, you know, our listeners, hopefully you can see like, this is what's happening in the world around us, right? Yeah. This is, this is what has been come to be called critical theory. And you'll see it in different forms. There's critical race theory. There's the critical feminist theory, right? But basically what it is, it's, it's coming from this school. It's coming from this guy and his, and his, you know, uh, contemporaries who Wrecking, who thought that the fundamental structure of reality was the conflict between oppressor and oppressed, mm. that that is what reality is made up of. And if we are going to get to where we want to go, whatever that means, if we're going to reach liberation, whatever that means, according to Marcuse, the oppressed have to overcome and overthrow the oppressors. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to cultivate that spirit in whatever way he possibly could. So if I, like I mentioned, if I can, if I can cultivate that in the feminists, if I can cultivate that in the radical student movements of the 1960s and the good. oppressed Negro class of the time, the oppressed Negro class of the time. Exactly. Yeah. If I can get into the universities, right. And start to cultivate these ideals within the academia, that's what we need. We're going to overthrow everything. Interestingly, um, there is one more point I want to make before, you know, we get to kind of the, the two steps that he thought were necessary to reach this two-dimensional society that he wanted. There's kind of a historical irony that Marcuse notices. He says that the very things that make society one-dimensional, the technology, the overemphasis on reason, the kind of um, sophisticated systems of oppression that are in place, those very things also provide us with the means by which we can 
arrive at a two-dimensional society, yeah. right? So precisely because, and again, he's a Marxist, he's Hegelian, he's reading history. He thinks that, okay, the conditions of history are changing now, which means human nature is changing, everything's changing. And what he's seeing right now is, okay, these forms of oppression, they still exist. But history has brought us to this place where now we, we have this incredible technology. Now we have this incredible wealth. And so what history is basically telling us is that we need to, as if history were this living thing, what history is telling us is basically that we need to now seize this technology, seize this incredible wealth, and use it to overthrow the system that's oppressing us in order to arrive at, well, a society that he envisions without toil, without hardship, without scarcity, without poverty, without hunger, right? Again, it's this utopian ideal that he is pursuing. So, which again, is interesting because again, the shift in Marxism here becomes ideologically motivated. How do you change a people? It's by changing their ideas. And how do you do that? Well, you use the same means that they used to oppress you. Yeah. Namely yeah, social well media, namely the TV, um, yeah, we're, yeah. radio yeah. channels, uh, textbooks, essays. What are they doing? Oh, they like that? Let's, let's take it there. Oh, they're on their iPad? Let's take it there. They're in the universities? Let's take it there. Right? And, th- and this, is, this is, again, the, the, the deep, I don't even know what you call it, dude, the deep cynicism of the yeah. spirit of this yeah. Spirit. I mean, it's what they're calling it. You know, they're almost yeah. naming it that way. Um, some sort of, yeah. But I just want, I just like our, our listeners to understand this, these, these trends that we see in, in contemporary society, they're not accidental. They didn't just show up out of nowhere. This was, this, this, this way of thinking was planned and it was intentional. That's what blew me away when you shared this guy with me. And it's like, you know, we've talked about Nietzsche, we've talked about Foucault. And so some of those ideas I see influencing our society, but like this was an intentional plan and these are these are uh, for all intents and purposes brilliant thinkers oh really smart right and, and i think that's what i found fascinating when when i was first exposed to him i think as, as you had an, an experience with joey you know when i first read them and i was like holy crap like they saw the movements happening in the u.s and they foresaw how a revolution their foresight was incredible yeah and their ability was. to to recognize that and then use that and deeply influence that. Yeah. You know? Now, ultimately, even though they were brilliant, even though they noticed some things that were true, their their solution to these problems was diabolical and, and I, exactly and and evil. So right? I was going to say, because it's intentional, it shows you the gravity yeah. of what, they're, pro- what yeah. they're proposing. Yeah. It shows you the maliciousness of what they're proposing. So, okay. Marcuse, Marcuse, he sees a one-dimensional society full of one-dimensional men. He wants a two-dimensional society full of two-dimensional men who are criticizing and revolutionizing constantly. How do we get there? How do we get to this two-dimensional society? Well, there's, there's two things we need, right? There's two things we need. Let's do it. The first one is a new sensibility. Max, what is a new sensibility? What does he, what does he mean? This is a, a term that he uses, right? Yes. Yeah, so we're trying to, to shape a new sensibility in the people. Um, Briefly put again, it's it's simply to, to reshape human relationships and human nature. Reshape human nature, right? right? Uh, because again, in his mind, it's they've been concentrated or at least framed by technology, mm-hmm. by this dominant structure of reason. And so he's calling for a new sensibility, a new consciousness, a, a motivated idea of oneself and society. So he's calling for a reshaping of, of human relationships and nature. Um, and also an emphasis on the subject, which I think here he 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 takes from Freud, Sigmund Freud, mm, yeah. who uh, the Frankfurt School was deeply influenced by. The emphasis on the subject to unleash his instincts, yeah, right, to take anew his emotions, his passions, his desires, whatever they are, to help influence and motivate a new teleology, a new nature of man, Mm -hmm. the end of man. What is the purpose of human relation? What is the purpose of human nature? Um, His idea was that we need to build a new sensibility in the people that helps their instincts flow naturally and whatever he considers freely Mm -hmm. so as to develop a new idea of what the end, what the purpose of human life is. This is people protesting and screaming in the streets, even though you don't even really know what they're mad about, right? This is people just unleashing their sexual passions, going every which way, thinking that that's going to get them to liberation. Whereas we as Christians, of course, we understand that human nature does not change, that God has created us for a particular purpose, namely to know him and to love him and, and to flourish. And so if we want to 
if we want to flourish as human beings, it's not just following our passions any which way they take us. And we all know that. Like, yeah. I don't know why we're preaching that. It's just like, that's, if we're, if we're honest with ourselves for a second, we know that's not the case. I yeah. mean, think about yourself at your worst. You probably were doing everything you wanted for the most just part. Just felt like doing, right? And so this is a great, like, yeah. No, okay. And then the great lie. Okay, sorry. We'll get, we'll get to the next point, but I just want to make this point right now. Um, so what someone like, whatever you wish, Deacon, (laughs) what someone like Marquise would probably say is like, Oh, those Christians, they want to repress your emotions. They want to repress your desires. They want to keep you bottled up and not let you live fully. And what you have to do to be liberated is just let it all explode. No, what we've talked about on this podcast so many times is that flourishing doesn't come from a repression of your desires, but an integration of your desires into your person so that they're channeled towards what you're ultimately created for, which is to know and to love God and others, right? To live in relationship with others. And to know yourself. And to know yourself, right? So it's not like the caricature that these people would set up of the Christian life as this form of repression that leaves you twisted and like a bottled up rocket that's about to explode. But no, the Christian life actually sets you on fire, but in an ordered and beautiful way. Yeah. So Marcuse wants a new sensibility, yeah, that's one of the ways that you develop this two-dimensional man. I mean, that's the other thing that he says is going to help us get there is what he calls the great refusal. Hmm. Let's unpack that. What's the great refusal? I think it's, it's actually relatively simple, at least. And similar to what to, we've been exactly saying. Exactly, to, yeah. to our knowledge. But it's the great refusal is to say no to the systems of repression and domination, mm-hmm. right? You see a structure of sin, you see a system of injustice, and you don't align yourself to it. Not only do you not align yourself to it, you violently try to seek to revolutionize it. Yeah. Right. Um, this and is, so, if I might be so bold, this is something like taking a knee during the national anthem. Or um, starting a rally in your school based off of a held view of gender. Yeah. Right. Uh, and I think that's... I want to make this point, which I don't think we've made or could ever make enough. It's not as if what we're talking about here, guys, is detached from reality. The reason that we wanted to talk about Herbert Marcuse is because we see his idea seeping into our American culture particularly, but the Western world at large. Mm -hmm. And this is no small thing that he's calling for here. Mm -hmm. It's not like, oh, well, just say no. You know, if somebody's being mean to you, it's not like that. It's deeper than that. It's radical. It's it's a radical change. Um, Not caring for others. Uh, not regarding tradition, not caring for history, um, really becoming trying to make yourself God. I mean, that, that, and that's that's at the which is the fundamental temptation at the root of every sin. Which is why when people hear, "Oh, yeah, I just need to let my desires go and stand up to the man and overcome and overthrow," I need to reach out and grab the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and then take control and become God. It's like, yeah, that's that's attractive because that's what my sinful nature wants to do. Yeah, and I know I'm better than them. I know I'm better than that person. I'm t- more talented. So I'm going to do that yeah. at whatever means necessary. So this great refusal was simply saying, no, I will not submit myself to those oppressive systems. And not only that, we're going to work against the established institutions. But interestingly enough, and it goes to my quote from earlier, it's working within these institutions to do what? To dismantle the university system. That's oppressing me. To dismantle the, the social medias, the media channels, to dismantle, and I would argue, civilization from its core. And replant it, surplant it with this new consciousness, with this new two-dimensional man. So this is um, something that Marcuse and some of these members of the Frankfurt School intentionally planned and called the long march through the institutions, right? So that, well, I'm going to read a quote here from, from Marcuse, but basically they knew that this revolution wasn't going to take place overnight, right? That was... They thought that that was part of the mistake of the Marxist movement originally. It's like, we thought this was going to happen quick, that the proletariat were just going to rise up. They're like, no, we need to be smarter. We need to plan on this. We need to play the long game. Yeah. And so listen to this quote from Herbert Marcuse. It's from his book called Counter-Revolution and Revolt. He says, to extend the base of the student movement, a thinker named Rudy Dutschke has proposed the strategy of the long march through the institutions working against the established institutions while working within them, but not simply by boring from within, rather by doing the job, learning how to program and read computers, how to teach at all levels of education, 
how to use the mass media, how to organize production, how to recognize and eschew planned obsolescence, how to design, etc. And at the same time, preserving one's own consciousness in working with others, one's own radical consciousness, revolutionary consciousness. That's so diabolical, dude. It's holding yourself onto a power that's so dark. He says the long march includes the concern, the concerted effort to build up counter institutions. They have long been an aim of the movement, but the lack of funds was greatly responsible for their weakness and their inferior quality. They must be made competitive. This is especially important for the development of radical free media. The fact that the radical left has no equal access to the great chains of information and indoctrination is largely responsible for its present isolation. Building counter institutions. This is why in our current American university system, there's more money being given to our DEI institutions than there is to actual educate, actually educating students, right? Like these are the type of institutions. There's more administrators, at a lot of our American universities than there are students. And it's because people who knew Marcuse, who read his works, who were influenced by him are now working at the highest, highest levels of our American institutions and trying to foment this revolutionary spirit by fomenting this idea of you're being oppressed. You need to overcome, you need to overthrow. And that is, is kind of scary, but it's helpful to know that yeah. this is where it came from, you know? Instead of talking about overcoming the bourgeois, they started talking about racism, yeah. sexism, imperialism, colonial, co colonialism. Um, yeah, and crazy. these are all words that we're familiar with, guys. And these are the words that were chanted throughout the marches in the U.S., uh, hippie movements sexual revolution and this, this and, and this is this is not it's not like it's gone i guess is part of what we want to say it's not as if these uh ideologies have just left our society oh yeah look reagan came in and he crushed them and we have no more marxist around and no, we're doing we're pretty good, good. Yeah. um that's not true guys they've just they've just moved to the universities <laughs> um and they are I, this is a very bold claim but i, I think they are in fact creating a new consciousness is my fear is my fear is that it's actually kind of working. Yeah, certainly they're not creating a new human nature because human nature doesn't change, but they are, they're, they're dramatically influencing our culture mm -hmm. and the way that especially the younger generations think and interact with reality or don't interact with reality. And you know, what's interesting to you. One thing I wanted to mention here, yeah. part of their literature was also guided by this idea of um, white skin privilege. Really? Yeah, so this is, cl I mean, that's classic right. Frankfurt School. And, that, and that's theory. another, again, the, the critical theory, uh, uh, keeping in mind what we've talked about before, right? You criticize the systems of oppression and you seek to revolutionize them. I mean, this is this is a pattern of, in their mind, history. And you know what's interesting, though, about this cycle, criticizing, revolutionizing, criticizing, revolutionizing, it's that for them it's perpetual. It never ends. It's a consistent thing because why? Because history continues. Yes. And history is this playing field of time. And time, this history, allows reality to unfold in a particular way in a particular time. And so the whole Frankfurt School, the Marxist idea is that revolution has a, has, has, people have to purify themselves constantly through yeah. this means, yeah. criticizing, revolutionizing, criticizing, revolutionizing. And unfortunately, it's taking on a new form. Can I say something about that? Because now we've, you know, we've presented what really what we want to present, but maybe just we can reflect a little bit on our thoughts about this in the last few minutes of this episode. Um, as we've been having this conversation, I've just been thinking, okay, what's, what's good, what's bad in Marcuse? Obviously, I think hopefully we've shown what's bad, these um, his ultimate proposal you know, to revolutionize, to overthrow, to undermine, to deconstruct the society in which we live. Something that I think is, you know, not admirable, but, but at least uh, not completely insane is this idea of, you know, being somewhat critical of the society in which we live. I think that's okay. I think that's actually important because, in, you know, in a Christian understanding, we have this idea of, well, original sin right? And the spirit of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And these things are present in society and they do impact us, right? So if we are going to really be set free from what matters, set free from sin, we do have to be aware of the way in which our societies are imperfect, which they're fallen. There are unjust structures. There are things that do oppress us. Um, so it's not wrong to be critical. It's not wrong to think deeply about the way that I'm being influenced by the culture in which I live. 
But what is wrong and what is diabolical is to take that knowledge and then therefore to, without any gratitude, without any reverence for tradition, without any reverence for the good that is present in my society, seek to undermine it completely and destroy it and build it anew as if I were God and I could do better than he did, right? The Christian should, we talked about this on one of our episodes with, uh, um, we had a conversation about liberalism and stuff like that and civil law and, and, uh, and canon law. And one of the things we talked about was the, the virtue of piety, right? And so, patriotism. And patriotism, right? So the virtue of piety in the tradition, according to St. Thomas and, and a lot of the church fathers, is it's this virtue that it's, it's kind of a part of the virtue of justice, mm-hmm. right? Rendering someone what they're due. And piety is rendering to my parents, to my family, to my community, to my nation, what is due to them. A religion. To my religion. And there's this fundamental recognition of the fact that I have received so much, everything from my parents, from my family, from my nation. And even though it's imperfect, I owe them a certain amount of respect. I owe them a certain amount of love, injustice, right? Like this is, and if I'm going to be a virtuous person, I need to actually practice that respect. I need to show that respect. Now, part of that respect can be recognizing those imperfections within my family, within my parents, within my nation, and then working to correct them, correct them, but not by destroying them by and also, baptizing them like we talked about in our exactly. last episode right by redeeming them by drawing out what is good within them but here's and redeeming the thing though, them Joey, in christ yeah, go sorry, crazy. yeah exactly that's it redeeming them in christ see th- th- one of the major issues with this whole school and with the whole marxist ideology is that you save society yourself yes yes right and so how do you help bring imperfections to perfection by perfection we mean on the process towards that which is whole Mm -hmm. is and can only be through grace. Yeah. That's it. Right. And we can do, we can do what we can, but I speaking for myself am a limited man, right? My family has their own issues. I can only do so much. I can only talk to my mom and my dad so much, my siblings so much, right? I could be the best model. Okay. So I try to do that. But then after a while, we can start noticing that people are more complex than what I think the exterior things necessary to fix the situation are. Yeah. Right. That grace and our, our, our Lord is the one that's going to purify their minds and their hearts. So as to be able to love what is good, true and beautiful properly. Mm-hmm. And this idea that we can save that, that we can help that. We can reconstruct. We that. can reconstruct that on our own means by violent means in this particular instance is wrong. Fundamentally wrong. It has not worked. It does not work. Right. We have to trust that sometimes our Lord works beyond temporality, beyond history in this case, yeah. beyond time. Grace is not limited to our bounds of how God should work. God works sometimes way after our death, right? And grace is not limited to what we think in, in the way in which God should work here and now. Sometimes the prayers of the mother, of the grandmother, of the dad for their child doesn't take effect until way later. And so our duty as Christians is not to live like these Marxists, revolutionizing, criticizing everything, this negative scope, right? It's to live in the spirit of our Lord, in the consciousness of our Lord, as JP2 talks about all the time, of the Holy Spirit. He's the one that's guiding us. If you want to change society, if you want to revolutionize, repent and believe in the gospel. That's it. That's like... You, and you see this in the Acts of the Apostles and the writings of St. Paul and the writings of the first letter of Peter. He's like, look, they lived in Rome, right? In this pagan society where there was child sacrifice, where there was worship of pagan gods. They would have had every reason. Every, they would have been perfectly within their right to criticize the society, to say, okay, we're going we're gonna to plant the gospel here by trying to undermine the Romans. But that's not what they did. No, so. They just loved the Lord. They worked on converting their own hearts. They obeyed their lawful superiors, right? Thinking that, okay, even though these men are imperfect, they've been given authority by God. And so I'm going to submit to them insofar as it's consistent with my, with my religion, um, out of respect for God, out of that virtue, virtue of piety, that virtue of justice. But what's going to change the world is cleaving to Jesus Christ crucified. That's it. And that's what we saw happen. That's how the first Christians started this 
incredible movement that changed Roman society into Christendom. They didn't seek to overthrow. They didn't seek to undermine. They loved. And that's not to say that the Christian tradition hasn't expressed itself in negative ways, right? Oh, for sure. It has. Yeah. It's, it has, in fact, abused and, um, I dare say, uh, even maybe had some malice behind evangelical missions on certain territories. And even been influenced by Marxism. In some exactly. Times, right? This is a, so liberation my, theology and stuff. Correct. Yeah. But, but an authentic Christian spirit does not operate under those premises. Uh, it, it recognizes the imperfections in a system, but it seeks to redeem them and reconcile them in Jesus Christ, um, in grace. And I'm going to take it another step to bring together the fragmentations of society, the tearing apart of our society, of persons, and offering them to our Lord in the Holy Mass. Mm. That's the way we're able to unify things again. That's the way we're able to remember, bring back together, remember the things that have been dismembered. Um, it's only in the body and blood of our Lord um, as an ordinary means by which grace enters into this world. And so it's not by criticizing just living in this revolutionary spirit. It's by living in, in the spirit of our God, of our, of our Lord, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And that may seem simplistic to many people, but try living that real reality out for a second. It's difficult. It's demanding, but it's beautiful. And it's true. It's real. And that's why we believe in him. Because he's real. Dude, do you want to go to Mass? We do have Mass here in a little bit. We should, we should probably go do that here, here soon, huh? This I, is a great episode. I actually learned by talking to you, which... That's coming from Deacon Joey. It does sisters. happen. It actually happens a lot. Max teaches me a lot. Thank you. I hope that our listeners enjoyed this episode. I hope that it gives you an understanding of the moment in which we live in history, some of the trends that we see around us. Um, yeah, some of Marc Marcuse's stuff, I've, I've read a little bit of it. It's, it's, it's kind of cool to read. You, know? you get to see, again, the intentionality of all this. So if you want to do that, you can. Your life's not going to be any worse if you don't read Marcuse. Yeah. If you want to read scripture instead, that'd probably be better. But he's worth thinking about. He's worth knowing, which is why we did this episode. Max, any final thoughts? Uh, I do recommend um, that book, The American Cultural Revolution. Yeah. Uh, why the Radical Left Has Dominated Everything or something like that. Sorry, I'm, I'm probably butchering the title, but uh, I'll, I'll put it down in the description below. Recommend yeah, yeah, yeah. it. And I also recommend that talk that Christopher Rufo had with uh, Bishop Barron. And I'll also link our resources down below. So, guys, that's all I have. You good? That's all I got. Deacon, you sure? Happy Solemnity of St. Joseph. Yeah. Let's ask for his intercessions on this day. As always, God bless. <laughs>